Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search specializes in helping small law firms in Texas hire lawyers and build great teams. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel here back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to remind you that Varsity Search was recently retained by a general practice firm in Arlington to help them grow their family law team. So if you value inclusivity, teamwork, diversity, humility, and cost-effective client service, and you have at least two years of family law experience, we want to hear from you. You can email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com, or you can go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers to get more information and to apply, of course, confidentially, um, as uh, shouldn't have to be said, but I will say it anyway. (laughs) All right. All right. Today we head to Austin, where our guest is Haley Turner. Haley is a partner with Walsh Gallegos, where she and her firm practice education law. And specifically, Haley works with school districts in the areas of governance, employment, and student issues. She also works with charter schools on issues such as renewal, amendment, or consolidation of charters. And I'm sure she's had nothing going on as it relates to COVID-19 and reopening schools. So uh, we're super glad that Haley made time to be with us uh, today on the show. Haley, uh, she also authors the Ask a Lawyer column for the Texas Association of Secondary School Principals. All right, with that, let's hop into our conversation with Haley Turner on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. All right, Haley Turner joins us today. Haley, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, um, we've got a lot of things to, to dive into. And the first thing I want to ask you about is uh, just uh, some of the current events that are happening within our world, obviously, but also specifically how it uh, ties into uh, the legal profession and our lives as lawyers. Um, first with COVID-19, um, maybe just uh, share a, a little bit about um, some of the things that you've learned over the last uh, few months in how to practice in this environment um, and maybe things that will uh, uh, continue to stay with us after we uh, leave COVID-19 behind, which is hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, God willing. I, right. I think I'm cer- I've certainly learned a lot. I think probably the most important thing is just the reality of having to practice law via video conferencing and always with technology involved Yeah, that you just, you can't take the profession as, as formally as we normally would, right? Suits and um, jockeying for position around a council table. It's just doesn't happen anymore. We're seeing the real side of people. And so understanding, I mean, I've kind of enjoyed the ability to just get down to the like the core of lawyering, which is what are, what's the evidence and what's the law say? And can we convince somebody about that Yeah. without all of the distractions and trappings of <clears throat> formal lawyering that we've built over the years, right. probably to protect our egos. So <laughs> I, I had a, a, a nine hour evidentiary hearing last week via zoom. Oh and my gosh. I guess we had witnesses sworn in from like their cell phone, like yeah. just looking straight up a witness's nose. And so it, it really, it really takes you back to what, what are we here for? Yeah. It's not necessarily about the posturing. It's just about practicing law. And, yeah. um, so I've, I've really as, as challenging as it is, enjoyed that side of it. Sure. Uh, what have you figured out about how to, uh, best conduct things by zoom or by video conference? Are there anything that you, you didn't know? those first couple of times out that, that now you've kind of figured out or some hacks or tricks or just anything that has made it easier for you? I mean, I didn't know anything to start with. So, <laughs> right. so, so, so it's all gravy at this point. I, it's all uphill. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Um, you know, I think understanding the technology 
is really important. Obviously, when you're going through mediations um, or going through hearings where you need to have certain information only shared with certain people on a video right. conference, right? Right. You've got to make sure that you know how the technology works so that you can maintain confidentiality yes. and follow the procedures. Um, and not be stuck looking like a fool and have it video recorded. So <laughs> yeah, it's good to avoid that. Absolutely. Um, w- once we're, uh, I kind of hinted at this before, but once we're through all of this, what are you either expecting or maybe hoping stays with us uh, as we uh, move forward with the practice of law that we've adopted or had to have kind of been forced to adopt during this period during COVID? Oh, I've got a lot of answers to that. I think I think one of them goes back to what I where I started with, which is I think over over decades the practice of law, sometimes necessarily, sometimes unnecessarily, has taken on a lot of layers of <clears throat> unnecessary process and formality that don't that don't really do anything to to move the ball forward mm-hmm. um, as far as what our end goal is, and so. I hope that we start taking ourselves less seriously and the practice of law more seriously. Yeah. Um, and focus more on our profession and less on peacocking, right? You know, less on the attention seeking side of things because that's, that can often be a distraction and it honestly costs more time and more legal fees that may not otherwise be necessary. So I hope that that, that, that results from this. Um, and just, I, I have enjoyed seeing my clients more often. Um, I I typically see my clients in person. I drive out to wherever they are, but yeah, but phone calls just aren't quite the same. And so we've had this technology for years. We've never thought to use it until we had to. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to have face-to-face engagement remotely more frequently than we have in the past. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I wonder where just the kind of regular old school phone call goes after all this is over, because, you know, it's kind of like when we were growing up and you'd see the movies where all the futuristic calls were all on a big video screen, whether it was Star Trek or Back to the Future or whatever else. I'm dating myself, obviously. Um, But uh, it was like, okay, when are we going to get these cool video calls? And then we've kind of had it in some way or form uh, in the last maybe seven to 10 years, but we haven't really used it in like the just that's the way we call people. Um, but now we kind of have adopted more of that. So it'd be interesting to see, yeah, whether the, the actual just audio phone call, um, anymore is something that people do. I mean, maybe that'll go the way of the fax machine where people laugh yeah. about, you know, phone calls where you can't see the other person, but yeah, yeah. I'm still always interested when I see a fax number put up prominently on someone's contact. (laughs) What's happening here? Who is your client base? (laughs) I don't know what's going on here. Um, uh, Well, um, so uh, shifting gears to the other uh, current topic of the day, and and we've talked about it on the show for the last several weeks, um, and that is just the issue of racial justice in this country, and specifically as it relates to lawyers and law practice. Um, uh, I'm a white guy, you're a white girl. Um, And uh, what do you think uh, is something that just as, you know, lawyers in the profession, um, especially younger lawyers that are part of this audience, especially ought to be thinking about when it comes to this issue as it relates to their career, as it relates to how they maybe think about pro bono efforts or just within their own law firm and how things are operating within their firm. Um, What are some things that, you know, should be on their minds and, and, and things they should be thinking about? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, all of us have to give real thought and attention to reflecting on how how we've handled ourselves in the past, right? How we've approached issues that we've held, that we've handled as lawyers or otherwise, um, and make sure that we're educating ourselves on the facts and the real issues and, and remaining mindful of these obviously very complex concerns in our practice of law. Yeah. I mean, yes, our job is to zealously advocate for our clients, but you know, I represent public entities. And so we deal with people from all walks of life on a regular basis. And my job is to represent the best interests of my clients, but also do so in a manner that does not um, put forward negative, inaccurate, out of date ideas, stereotypes, 
and concepts. We don't have to sacrifice our morals and ethics for the representation of our clients. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we've got to all make decisions for ourselves about how we advocate and what that looks like. But, um, but I feel like in doing the job, we just have to remain mindful of our obligation as a you know, citizen of the world yeah. and our obligation to ourselves and to our coworkers and our fellow attorneys and fellow citizens as to how we put ourselves forward and represent the legal profession. Um, because, you know, the purpose of the legal profession is to ferret out injustice, yeah. whether it be by the government or whether it be between private citizens. And um, we cannot forget our role in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, and I know that will be an ongoing conversation that we have here at, at, and not just here, but uh, uh, in the in the in the country. So uh We'll let you hear more about your practice. You've hinted at it a couple of times in the work that you do, but uh, I'd love for uh, our uh, audience to hear more about uh, what you do, what your firm does. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I'm a partner in the law firm of Walsh, Gallegos, Trevino, Russo, and Kyle. I, I think I say all five names maybe three times a year, <laughs> only when officially called upon. <laughs> um, we are a, we have six or seven offices in the state of Texas and one in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and we exclusively represent public schools. Um, we have, a, you know, a few counties or municipalities here and there, but 99.9% .9 of our clients are <clears throat> publicly funded K through 12 schools. Yeah. And that representation focuses on a, a variety of different areas. I serve as general counsel for a number of districts across the state um, and represent them in day-to-day -day issues, as well as um, administrative hearings and up through um, litigation. We have a litigation team. Uh, we have a transactions team. We have a special education litigation team. So we pretty much are a one-stop shop for the most part for school districts and charter schools who are um, seeking legal advice and legal representation. Um, and in that regard, I get to enjoy at least I did many hours on the road <laughs> heading out to school districts all across the state to go to their board meetings and yeah. um, engage with their administrators and their students and their educators. And so that's certainly something I'm missing right now. Sure. Well, and uh, I, I, I imagine that at this uh, over the last few months um, in dealing with this COVID crisis, school districts are, are one of the front lines uh, after the healthcare industry, I would say, probably with regards to uh, that issue. Um, what has, uh, and I want to ask you about other hot topics going on in, in the world of education and school law, but but let's start with, with that. What was, what was it like over these, or how, how has it been over these last few months in working with school districts, um, both in wrapping up this past school year and looking ahead to what they're having to face from a, a legal standpoint and everything else going into uh, the next school year? <laughs> it's been a wild ride. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Once in a century. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we are, I, I represent a lot of districts on the Gulf Coast, and so Every year we have a hurricane come through, right? And so I'll have a handful of districts who have an emergency closure yeah, and they need all hands on deck. So I've been through very short periods of yeah. school district emergency localized. Um, never, of course, have we been through statewide um, emergency situation that is so uncertain and so outside of our control. Yeah. And so it's it, it has been a challenge. Most of our time is spent trying to figure out how we operate and how our clients fulfill their obligations to students and employees within this new world that we're currently stuck in and how the laws apply or if they don't apply. And so it's, it has been very challenging. Um, it, I'm, I'm happy to have a job that is needed during yeah. this time for sure. Um, and I can say you hit the nail on the head, school districts being on the front line. Yeah. School districts in, in most small Texas towns are the largest employer. They're the municipality with the uh, largest budget in many towns. Yep. And so because of that, many social obligations outside of just education fall on um, school districts to fulfill. And so that, that has certainly been challenging. And we, every day, 
deal with districts who have positive cases and then how we respond to that to make sure that we're protecting kids and employees and ourselves. So it's, it is continuing to develop. We're still waiting to see what our next school year is going to look like and what our funding is going to look like. So no end in sight, but it's certainly um, a good challenge. No day is boring. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and by the time uh, people are listening to this episode, we'll probably have a decision made, I would assume, as to um, whether school is opening, how it's opening, and all of that. Um, right now, are your clients uh, in the school district you represent mostly um, – putting together, I imagine, multiple contingency plans for what things look like? Or is it sort of we're assuming we're going to be opening normal time, normal day in the fall? Or, or kind of what's been the client you know, uh, response to this and le- looking ahead, obviously keeping <laughs> track of every time Governor Abbott's going to step up to the mic <laughs> and make something out Yeah. It. He is largely running our roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. um, you know, until a couple of days ago, yeah, they were planning. I mean, I would like to say they were planning for all contingencies. I'm sure they were. But there was also just a bunch of we don't know and how can we plan. The yeah. biggest head scratcher being how do you bring thousands of kids back to a closed space with adults and prevent the spread of a, the virus if it's not contained by then. And I don't think it will be. Um, we got word from the commissioner a couple of days ago that there's you know, going to be an approach that is a mix of virtual and in-person learning based on a parent's choice. Right. And so, you know, that raises a whole slew of other questions um, <laughs> yeah. that that we're going to have to work through over a very busy summer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, every every complication that is related to this pandemic impacts all of the other normal legal issues we've got to deal with on a day to day basis. Um, so, yeah, it, it's complicated for everybody, but certainly just how to operate is top of the list and then how that impacts everything else comes next. Yeah. Uh, and I do want to have, uh, ask you about other issues. What, what are, uh, some of the, uh, or maybe just even, uh, just for sake of time, one or two other, uh, things that are, uh, either just hot topic items within the world of school and education law or things that have been cropping up lately, kind of setting COVID aside, obviously, uh, for that. Um, what, what else is going on in, in, in your world? <laughs> well, it's tough to set COVID aside, but I will I do yeah. that. Um, you know, a couple of developments I would say are pretty significant. Um, not the least of which is the Supreme Court's ruling on the application of Title VII um, to sex discrimination in the workplace, yeah, um, and the and the impact that will have on the interpretation of Title IX, which protects, as you know, students from sex discrimination. Yeah. Um, so uh, up until this point, I had been advising all of my clients at, in line with what the Supreme Court has now decided. It's just the way of. Yeah. Of equal rights for all of your students and to put everybody on the same plane. Right. But we've got support for that now, which is which is a great thing. Um, yeah. So we'll be, you know, working through that. We also do have new Title IX regulations that came out of the Department of Education that are right. pretty significant yeah. when it comes to investigation and response to sexual harassment. Right. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time this summer training our clients and their employees about their obligations in that regard. Um but just yeah. a lot of things to be done yeah. to start the school year. And those two are huge. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You're referencing, of course, uh, the Bostock case uh, this past week. We're recording this June 25th. Um, the 6-3 decision written by Justice Gorsuch, which uh, was an interesting compilation of justices and uh, mm-hmm. uh, d- interpretations of Title VII. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, of course, the, the ramifications of that decision, like you said, through Title IX, but through uh, all sorts of uh, other potential statutes that reference um, uh, sex and sex discrimination and what that looks like. So um, that's going to be interesting for sure. And then, yeah, it seems like with every administration, we're going to have this ping pong back and forth with Title IX, um, uh, investigation, enforcement, uh, making sure whoever you know, whatever parties' rights are being held up and and, and mm-hmm. uh, given fair shake, all of that. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard to keep it's up. Hard to, yeah, no, it really is uh, all the time. So, well, that's interesting.
interesting stuff. Um, so uh, a lot of, I mentioned earlier, our audience, uh, our, our younger lawyers getting started um, in their practice first few years. Um, I wonder if you could put yourself back in those shoes uh, when you were first getting into practice. What's something that you learned as a young lawyer that uh, has stuck with you and is an important part of uh, who you are now and, and will be as a lawyer? You know, well, first, Daniel, I want to say I still think of myself as a young lawyer. So, (laughs) and you are very, very young. Yes, you are. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I am eleven or twelve years in, but it feels like two. Sure. Um, You know, I think that as it's going to sound cliche, but I think that understanding that you don't know much when you start out as a new lawyer is really important. You know, the thing that your parents tell you when you're a kid is. You'll understand when you're older. And I, of course, hated that. I still hate it. They still say it to me. Um, But as a lawyer, that's absolutely true. There are just the practice of law and the relationships that you have to navigate during the practice of law are just incredibly complex. And so I think understanding that you've got to deal with the knowledge you have, but that you don't have the final answer, right? The final bit of information on every issue you're going to have to deal with. And being open to learning and taking input from other people is really important to keep yourself from painting yourself into a corner because you've not been willing to, to listen to other ideas. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good, good advice. Um, is there something that you've, uh, learned more recently, um, within the last couple of years that you would have liked to have known when you were first getting started? Um, and, uh, you can spare everybody, uh, (laughs) <laughs> the years in between. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. You know, I would probably say, um, taking vacations. I know again, like our, our jobs, we tend to drive ourselves into the ground and not have time for whatever a vacation looks like, even if it's just staring at a wall for a few hours. Right. And a lot of attorneys, uh, wear themselves down because of that. Yeah. And, um, and so finding whatever your center is, the place where you go and release that tension and recognizing that that is a necessary component to being an effective lawyer yeah. is is something I wish I would have known the first six years when I was busy, you know, like squeezing myself into a diamond because I was <laughs> so anxious about everything that was happening or could happen. Um, and so, yeah, I, if I could learn a lesson earlier, it would be that one. So, and, and I'm glad you brought this up because I think, um, and it, I think it connects to the broader issue of mental health within the profession and everything else, um, that we talk about quite a bit here and gets brought up by a number of guests and, uh, kind of a follow-up question to that. Cause I know as I'm sure you felt, uh, in those first few years, the, the pressure on you as a young lawyer, um, whether it's put on you by the firm, a partner, or just yourself, to perform and to set yourself up for long-term success, uh, I mean, drive so many of us to, to do what you did uh, to, and to work so hard um, to not take those vacations. H- how does someone kind of wrestle with that and get to the point of saying, oh, you know what, um, I-, I need to prioritize this and I'm, I know it may sacrifice something right now to take, these, take this week off here or that week off there or day off here, day off there. But how, how does someone kind of work through that and, and mentally get themselves to the place of, I can take this vacation? <laughs> um, yeah. Great question. Uh, I think first you've got to set your expectations of what a vacation is. Okay. Yeah. Because look, if I've got associates now and if they took two weeks to go to Spain, I, when I don't take two weeks off, you know, I might, <laughs> yeah. I might struggle with that. Sure. Um, no, there's honeymoons here and there and trips with your families. But at the beginning, you just have to recognize that your vacation, your mental health vacation is going to look different than it will 15 years into your practice. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And so you've got to identify what are, what are my going to be my effective um, releases from this level of stress. And sometimes it is just, I'm going to leave my cell phone in my house and I'm going to go on a run and no one can contact me. I'm not going to take my watch with me. Right. I'm just going to be alone Um, and sometimes it's a long weekend. So one, you just have to set your expectations and know it's not realistic to travel like you 
did maybe before you got the job. It's not going to work that way. Or in your gap year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In your gap year. There's not going to be any back, long backpacking trips. <laughs> right. No, no. You'll have no. to find yourself in like 45 minute increments. <laughs> right. Uh, um, so what's, you mentioned uh, you've got associates that you, uh, that, that work uh, for you and with you now, and you've done that uh, for a while. What, what's, uh, what's something that a, a young lawyer associate can do uh, to Im- impress you, to, to, uh, to really stand out? You know, I would say two things that, that are the most important, and that is being an effective communicator. Yeah. I mean, I would take communication over of a lot of other looks good on paper attributes. Yeah. Um, because without communication, all the rest of it doesn't matter. Hmm. So being an open, clear communicator, that means asking questions. That means admitting when you don't know something. That means pushing back when you disagree about something and doing so respectfully. Yeah. Communication is huge for me. Um, and the other is, you have to re- recognize you're going to be putting in more hours than than I would to do the same work. And that's just part of what is required to learn the practice, perfect your approach, and show me that you have the commitment to do that. Yeah. And then know that 10 years from now, you're going to be putting in time doing other things, yeah. but you're not going to be having to spend 10 hours on something because it will take you two. Right. Um, so I think that commitment to understanding the practice and then communicating about it is huge in showing your capacity to grow and develop in the work. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Uh, good advice. Um, when you're going through the process of hiring someone um, and going through a search, uh, however that might look for you guys, um, what's uh, what, what are one or two things? on uh, a resume um, or in a cover letter that you're uh, either looking for or to, for, from a positive or negative standpoint to eliminate or to include that person going forward? Oh, I would say top pet peeve is it's clear from a cover letter that it's a form letter. Yep. <laughs> and they have just plugged in the name of the firm. Hopefully they've yep. gotten that right. Yep. And they have no clue what yeah. we do. Yep. They and if they could have gone to our website and yeah. figured out some of that, they could have probably cut and pasted from the website and I wouldn't have known. <laughs> um not that I'm suggesting that. I'll be <laughs> no. looking for that now. Right, right. Um but that yeah. That will I well I will immediately pull you out of the pile. It and to the side, right? If you can't take the time to tell me why you want to work at my firm, yep. then we don't need to waste our time having that conversation. Yep. I, I don't want just a lawyer. I want a lawyer who's going to be committed to our cause and our yep. approach um, and our mission. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, to kind of hammer on that, because I know our, our audience hears that a lot and you're going to keep hearing that a lot, <laughs> folks. Sorry, um, because it's so important and it is one of the number one ways or reasons why uh, people either move forward or don't in an interview process, their hiring process. Um, and particularly when it's a firm um, like yours that has such a focused area of practice, um, you know, I mean, I think there's ways to do it when it's more of a general full service firm too. But um, but especially when it's you know, if the word school or education or something are not in the cover letter, I just don't even know what to tell you like, <laughs> for your firm. Like, it's, just, it's over. <laughs> yeah, it is over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so now, it's really important. I, I, Well, it it absolutely is. And I appreciate that it's hard when you don't have great context on the way that firms operate, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I had the benefit of being pretty deep, pretty deep into this line of work. And so I can easily rattle off what I would say in a cover letter, Right. but make an effort. We don't expect you to know the practice. We just expect you to show that you understand what's unique about what we do and that you want to learn. about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's a that's a that's a no no. Um, what's uh, what's something from a positive standpoint that you're looking to see? Um, resume or cover letter, I suppose. You know, I I want to see diverse work experience. Yep. You know, I want to see that you've tried a few different things and that, um, and unique work experience. I, yeah. I love to see, um, 
legal jobs and non-legal jobs that, um, that are described in a way that shows you were out just trying to learn what these different professions might look like, right? That just shows a genuine interest in learning a new skill. Yeah. Uh, and then if you can put some eye catching detail on your resume, that will help me remember yep. you. Yep. Even a silly factor detail. Yeah. That would be great. We had a, somebody in maybe on campus interviews once who put that she had won a hot dog eating contest. Like, we interviewed her. She yeah. was great. You and just want to hear I the story, her. right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, show your personality. Not too much. You know, right. But enough so that we'll know you're not just another, you know, number in a pile. Sure. No, that's really good. Um, well, uh, and then uh, lastly on this topic, what about within an interview itself? What's something that uh, or one or two things that you're looking for uh, in the interview setting? You know, I think I want to see that effective communication, right? I want to see somebody who can make eye contact and engage and who who can articulate why they're here, you know, why they want to do, mm-hmm. maybe not even just work for our firm, but what their yeah. desires are in the legal profession generally. Um, and I think I... You know, it's important that you show your personality. I know, ner- you know, interviews are nerve wracking. I haven't had to go to one in like 12 years. Yeah, so you've been at the it. same firm, uh, which is, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I'd probably give a terrible interview at this point, <laughs> but, um, but it's going to be nerve wracking, but you just have to set in your mind, I'm going to go into this interview and I am going to tell these people what I'm about and show them that I care what they do. And I want to learn about it and I want to be a part of it. Yeah. 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 Um, it's interesting. I, I think one, and I may have said this one other time on here. Um, but I think it's important and bears repeating because it ties into that, which is one of the things, especially all those years that I was talking to employers after on campus interviews. Uh, and even now as I'm working with more lateral folks and, and employers in that setting, Um, one of the things that people, uh, employers and interviewers will often say about candidates, um, from like a a critique standpoint is they don't exude confidence. They don't, uh, seem like they're confident in their abilities. And when you look at the list of who they interviewed or who they just talked to, it's someone that is very capable ordinarily outside of an interview setting is very confident. And you wouldn't think of as kind of the shy reserved, like meek type person, um, and there's something about you walking in the interview and that, and a lot of those people, um, that should have no problem with the confidence level, just, you know, for whatever reason, just, it doesn't come out. And, and uh, it, it is a big, um, uh, yellow flag, I would say for employers and interviewers, um, for m- many different reasons. One of which you mentioned, um, just from a communication standpoint, um, but others as well. And so I think for everybody, it's just, yeah, uh, having that confidence in yourself to show who you are. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not at all of who you are, maybe not what you would share in year 10 <laughs> Hold or 12. Something back, yeah. I'm sure you've shared more with your firm now than you would have in the interview. Years if ago. they could fire me, I'm sure they'd have plenty of reasons too. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, but showing your personality, like you want them, you want them to hire you for who you are. You don't want to get there. And then all of a sudden it doesn't click because they didn't learn who you were in the interview. Um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you just have to think about, all right, if we want to see how you, communicate. And that also extends to how you would advocate for a client. Yeah, and right. that means you're going to be fearful. You're going to be scared. If you're not scared, then you're probably, you know, ignoring signs, but you, you can also show confidence despite being scared about the outcome. And yeah. that's what we want to see. Not somebody who is perfect, but somebody who is bold and willing to yeah. speak out. Yeah, absolutely. Putting people in front of a client, putting people in front of a jury or judge, putting people in front of uh, whoever might be. I mean, you know, unless they're going to stick you in a room somewhere and just uh, load you up with writing, um, which could be. Um, and uh, yeah. there, there, there are places for that. Uh, but for the most most of the time, that, that's not going to be the case. And so they're going to want to see that. Um, so that's good stuff. Well, we're uh, near the end of our time. Is there anything before we get to our rapid fire questions here to close up, or is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd want to share uh, with us before we head to that? You know, the only thing I'll say, and yeah. I didn't bring this up, and that you know, what about like 
clerks or new associates do I perceive as a negative? Yeah. And it's really about how they respond to people telling them things that they don't know or maybe they should know. Hmm. And it's a fear of not knowing and people seeing that you don't know. And so I get a lot of clerks who, when I'm talking to them, they are indicating to me they know what I'm talking about. And they certainly don't. (laughs) And I don't expect them to. Um, I expect them to hear it and then go and learn about it. Yeah. And so I'm sure I had that problem as a younger attorney too. And so I would encourage uh, younger attorneys to be really mindful of how you are responding to other attorneys sharing information with you, talking through legal issues with you. I know that we all want to appear smart and capable, but in my world, appearing smart and capable is being willing to admit what you don't know and then working to learn it. Yeah. So know how you come off when you, okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Oh, sure. Right. When I know, I yeah. know that you don't know yeah. and I don't expect you to. Yeah, no, it's it's really good. And, and I mean, you take that to the furthest extent, it becomes an integrity issue, a character issue. It becomes a, a an honesty and truthful issue. Like you don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> so like that, that's not the signal you want to be sending. Um, yeah, to uh, your the partner or to whoever is talking to you. So yeah, that's I'm glad you brought it up. But uh, and uh, good good stuff. Well, uh, listen, we're running uh, to the end of our time. But I do want to finish with our uh, rapid fire questions. If you're ready. Uh, we'll uh, go through these. Let's do it. All right. Name one trait or characteristic you most want to see in an associate. Oh, um, I would say a combination of confidence and self-reflection, being self-aware. Cool. What habit has been key to your success? I would refer you to A, (laughs) healthy dose of confidence and self-reflection. A favorite app or productivity tool? Honestly, I have those giant post-its on my wall that I make to-do lists on, and it's old school, but it works. There you go. Yeah, old school stuff. Uh, your favorite social distancing activity? It used to be hiking, but people get too close to me, so oh, my no. friends and I will occasionally park our cars in a parking garage all facing each other and sit and have a happy hour in the afternoon. That's the best there thing you go. at this point. All right. The parking garage happy hour. I like it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and lastly, your favorite legal movie? None. None of them are real, and they all make the law seem more exciting and your wardrobe seem better. So <laughs> You're calling none. <laughs> none. I'm calling none. All right. Well, there you go. There you have it. Uh, an original answer for sure. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for that. Well, Haley, uh, really appreciate you taking time to be with us. Uh, wish you the best over this, I'm sure, crazy summer you're about to have and getting these schools ready to roll for <laughs> August, whatever that looks like. So thanks for taking some time with us. Thanks for having me, Daniel. All right. My thanks again to Haley Turner for joining us on the show today. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two things for me? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then also, would you please rate and review the podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? Would really appreciate that. Of course, if you have suggestions or thoughts about the show, you have recommendations for potential guests, would love to hear from you, Daniel at varsitysearch.com. Also, don't forget, if you or someone you know might have interest in a family law associate position in Arlington... You can go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers for information and to apply. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search, and we'll talk with you next time. Mm-hmm.